The Cube at Hadoop Summit 2014 is brought to you by anchor sponsor Hortonworks. We do Hadoop. And headline sponsor WAN Disco. We make Hadoop invincible. And welcome back, everybody. We are here live at Hadoop Summit in San Jose. I'm Jeff Kelly with Wikibon. You're watching theCUBE. And I'm here with my next guest, Joe Travellini, who's the Director of Product Marketing at Squirrel. Joe, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks, Jeff. Glad to be here. So we've had Squirrel on before. Uh, Eli Khan uh, has joined us many times to talk a little bit about uh, what you guys are doing. And I think Squirrel uh, is, is becoming pretty well known uh, throughout the industry with uh, the way you're, you're building an analytics platform on top of Accumulo. Uh, why don't you tell the, company, uh, tell the audience a little bit about the company and kind of what you guys have been up to for the last few months since we last talked. Sure, so we, we extend the open core of Apache Accumulo and Apache Hadoop. We really want to make it easy for people to, to build real-time applications on top. So Accumulo being a NoSQL database with a, a strong security heritage, obviously, originating at the NSA, we actually abstract away the big table style NoSQL data model. It's something that people, I don't think, realize that about us. We give you more of a MongoDB-like experience with JSON documents, mm -hmm. nested fields of JSON, and allow you to build graphs. So a graph, let's say you have two JSON documents as your nodes, you can draw an edge between them to indicate a relationship, and then you could do graph-based analytics to traverse, to search, to find patterns in your data. Talk, let's dig into that a little bit around uh, graph-based analytics. I mean, we've heard that described as the killer app or the potential killer app for, for big data. Why is graph-based analytics so powerful? It's powerful because there are certain analytics that you can do that you can't really do with a relational model. So I'll give you an example of one of our customers. Right? They have a graph structure and they're trying to find not only the discrepancies in the shapes of the graph, but also the time-based correlations within that. So if you deviate from a certain structure within a graph over time, it's really hard to express, okay, this, this data entity is connected to another data entity which is also connected to this third thing over time that relationship has changed, it's really hard to express that with a relational model. So it's about understanding relationships between entities over time. And so, so put some color on that. What, you know, let's say in a financial services organization, how, how would that be applicable? Sure, so in a financial services world, let's say you're sitting at a corporate treasury desk and you want to build an application for, let's say, counterparty risk. So you can model your financial institutions as nodes, debt positions could be outstanding between them as edges, you could enrich that with exchange rate forecasts. All these different entities, logically, that you want to track. To do a join in a, in a SQL style world to, to even specify the problem, let alone analyze it, is going to be an impossible task. Uh, so, so give us an update on the company itself. Where are you guys in terms of you know, headcount and, and the development of the company as itself? We've been watching you guys since the beginning, kind of seen you growing up. Where are, where are we today? Yeah, so I joined Squirrel in February, and since then I think we've hired five full-time employees, so we're growing pretty rapidly. Um, we're, we're about 30 employees now full-time, 20 of, of which are in engineering. Uh, we've got a couple of positions open if anybody's out there and interested in the Boston area. Um, we're doing real well, have well over a dozen customers. Um, not sure what you heard at the last update, but it continues to grow. Very good. Uh, yeah, I, it's always good to have somebody from Boston join me up here. Um, <laughs> we're surrounded by these Silicon Valley types. Um, it's good to have some East Coast cred back on the cube. Um, so, you know, what, what Squirrel, I think, was, is known for, for people who don't know Squirrel really well, is they think, you know, the cell level security. Um, and that's, you know, a, 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 an important part of the story, but it's only part of the story. And it's really an enabler to some of the other things that you're able to do. Put it in context, I mean, what, what role does security and, and your security capabilities play in, the, uh, in, in your larger value proposition? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we're kind of re reaching like an interesting inflection point here where traditional security and cyber security are kind of, that line between them is getting blurred, right? So the sophistication of attacks that are coming from APTs, insider threats, data flowing in, out, and across your networks with very little friction, um, it makes security a whole lot more important especially with big data, as I like to say, when you consolidate all your data into a single platform, you're really compounding the risk of protecting that data. Um, I don't think we've heard of like a major security breach that had to do with Hadoop just yet, but it seems like it's a target that's ripe for the picking. So it's really important to have that expressive, granular cell level control on your data. We take that a step further and enrich that with a number of engines, right? So the way Squirrel's cell level security works, every bit of data is 
has a series of labels attached to it that specify who can access it. We really built out the whole data-centric security ecosystem around that. So it's great to accommodate labels, but how do you get them on there? So we give you an engine that lets you specify rules that dictate you know, how data gets labeled. Let's say you want to do a regular expression. This thing looks like a social security number. Tag it with PII for personally identifiable information. We give you another engine that gives um, entitlements for authorizations for users to be able to access those labels. So let's say you know, we key on things like LDAP. This person's not a new hire. They've been in the system for greater than 30 days. We also enrich that with environmental attributes, circumstances under, under which you're making the request. So you're at an authorized terminal at work, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. If you meet all those conditions, then you can get access to data labeled PII. If any of those things isn't true, let's say you go home and VPN in on the weekend, why are you trying to do that? That might be an abnormal activity. We can deny access to the data. And we continue to enrich that with encryption, with secure search, which is an area that I think you know, we're the only big data vendor that has term level security on search indexes. That's a, a key advantage for us. Um, and, and auditing end to end across the system. Mm -hmm. um, so, so of course, the Squirrel is, is uh, and your, your analytic uh, platform sits on top of Hadoop. So Hadoop is a critical component, and, and you, you obviously will have a vested interest in the adoption of Hadoop itself uh, to kind of enable your business. What, what are you seeing out there in the field in terms of level of adoption, the types of organizations that are adopting Hadoop now? Are we still in that early adopter phase, do you think? Uh, where are we? Are we near the tipping point where Hadoop is about to go mainstream? Uh, what are you seeing out in the field, and, and maybe what, how, how has your experience here over the last couple of days impacted Yeah, your I, I definitely think we're at the tipping point, right? I, I've talked to very few people here that aren't using Hadoop in some capacity, whether it's still a POC capacity, they have Hadoop, right? More and more of our customers and prospects, we're going in, early on we'd be going in and they'd want us to set up Hadoop for them. That's pretty much no longer the case. Everybody's really, they've got a handle on Hadoop, they're talking to vendors, maybe they've got production support from one of the big platform providers. And for, from our perspective, you can bring your own Hadoop. We sit above that, so we have partnerships with like, you know, the five major providers mm -hmm. out there. Um, Another big topic here this week has been kind of the relationship between Hadoop and some of the analytics you can do in, in Hadoop now, and thanks to Yarn and uh, Cumulo and some of the other more um, advanced type of analytic platforms versus the data warehouse and the more traditional data warehouse from uh, the vendors we all, you know, the household names that are, that are back here as well. What's your view on that? How does, uh, where does Hadoop and the analytics that you provide, um, does it complement the more traditional data warehouse? Is there an overlap there? Is it going to be a replacement over the long term? What's your view? Over the very long term, maybe the 20 to 30 years, it might be an eventual replacement. I don't think a data warehouse is going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, the characterization of workloads that run a Hadoop are just totally different. We see what many others probably see, where people are offloading a lot of ETL types of workload from data warehouses into Hadoop. People are starting to realize the analytic complexity of things you can do, especially with like graph databases on top of Hadoop. So it gives you a different workload that really couldn't, you really couldn't accommodate or accommodate well in a traditional data warehouse. Mm. I, I don't think the established data warehouse providers have um, much of a threat from Hadoop you know, in the next 10 years, really. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's, we're seeing some overlap, but I think you know, we, there is it's going to be some competition for dollars when you're talking about offloading some of those workloads. Um, it could impact the, you know, the revenue of some of the data warehouse providers, but I, uh, I think you're, you're on to something. It's the, it, it is a longer term threat. Uh, but you're not going to see these vendors go away yeah, you know, in the next right. five years. That's not, that's not the situation. Right, I mean, we've probably all heard the vision from guys like Doug Cutting and Arun Murthy about you know, Yarn being the, the data operating system. It, it's interesting to note, you know, if you look at the, kind of the emergence of Hadoop, some could argue it has roots in cloud computing and virtualization. Y you have virtual machines now that they're almost a vestigial organ, right? You, you throw Windows or Mac or Linux in a VM and it's this container that you can put in your Elastic Cloud. But really at the end of the day, people have data and they have applications. They have workloads that they want to run on the data. Yarn and Hadoop bring us closer into that direction of like a distributed grid, but you know, it, there's still a lot of work to be done to, to make an enterprise ready from a multi-tenancy standpoint, resource control, as well as having those like canned apps that you can just throw on like the Apple App Store model and solve a problem really quickly. Mm. Uh, so I know you guys had an announcement this week um, around the new Test Drive VM. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so the Test Drive VM is something we're really excited about. It gives our customers and prospects a way, or people that are just interested, a frictionless way to, to try Squirrel hands-on without having to set up a Hadoop cluster. It's a self-contained virtual appliance with all the Hadoop demons running on it. With Squirrel pre-installed and configured, 
dummy data sets in there with you know, projects that you can load and play around with to learn how to do things the data-centric security way, to learn how to do things with our document and graph data model, mm -hmm. and to build applications. And over time, we're going to be releasing more and more um, stuff like out on GitHub with tutorials and blog posts that show people the power of a tool like this. Mm. Well, that's you know that's kind of a related question. It's, it's critical for a company like yours to attract developers. Uh, you've got to win the developer community for you guys to be successful long term. So this seems like one of the ways you're doing that. What are some other ways you're trying to um, really uh, gain um, you know, developer traction? Yeah, so we're, we're being very active, you know, conferences and trade shows like this, out on social media, on our website, really just continuing to deliver hands-on hands -on tutorials so people can, you know, rather than just having a data sheet, they actually have it, you know, at at the steering wheel, they're really building applications on top. All right, very good. Well, got time for just one more question. So, you know, what's on, uh, what's on tap for, for Squirrel? What can we look for in the next, you know, six months, 12 months? What are some of your top priorities? Yeah, so I mean, more and more when we're, we're talking to folks, people, people want more big data solutions than anything else, right? So we're looking at what we can do from a partnership perspective. You know, we're an operational data store being a NoSQL database, but people want operational applications. So what can we do, what areas can we focus on to give people turnkey solutions, partnering with other people in the ecosystem? I would say keep your eyes peeled for that. All right, and we will. Joe Travellini, thank you so much for joining us on theCUBE. Uh, we'll be right back uh, after this, so stay tuned.